bringing unity into the church. Notice what Ephesians 4 says. And he gave some as apostles and some as some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he do this? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long? Till we come into the unity of the faith. What are pastors for? What are evangelists for? What's an outreach for? Unity of the faith. And to the knowledge of the Son of God. And to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's God's way of bringing unity into a church. You know, I, I fear greatly when I walk into a church full of happy, beautiful Christians, and they all are just enjoying each other. They have lots of socials, they hang out, they love each other, they don't do evangelism. Have you ever heard that saying, an idle hands are a devil's workshop? You know, an idle church is a devil's workshop. If you are just enjoying each other, having socials, hanging out, just rejoicing Sabbath morning, that's good, that's a good start, but you are just asking for the devil to come and stir up issues. And more than once, I've seen beautiful churches who are just enjoying each other, refusing to go on God's mission, have Satan come in and stir things up so that by the time he's done, the people hate each other. He causes such havoc. But you know, we all have what I call potential energy. You know, I come in and I have a certain amount of focus that I, need, I could put somewhere. And if I'm not putting it out there, guess where I'm going to put it? I'm going to put it in here with all of us. And if we don't have our focus out there where God meant it to be, it's going to be on all of us. And a lot of the issues we face is because we're idle friends, because we're not busy doing God's work. And we just sit there, we're sitting ducks for the devil, he comes in, he causes issues. Oh, someone said your potluck food smells funny. Oh, he did, did he? And there we go, we got an issue. Well, I'm on his side, well, I'm on their side, and then split, there goes 20 people. Happens all the time. Why? Because largely, not entirely, but largely because we weren't doing God's work. Reason number five, because it brings the second coming of Jesus. Can you say amen? It brings the second coming of Jesus. If no other reason, this is a fantastic reason. I've gone over this verse already, but I'll go over it again. Looking for and doing what, friends? Hastening unto the coming of the day of the God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The Bible teaches that you can do something to make the second coming come sooner. If that's not motivating, I don't know what is. It can come sooner than it would have if you do something. And so if we don't do something, what's that imply? Maybe we don't want to go. Maybe we're pretty comfortable down here. It will come later than God intended it to. And inspiration told us, by the way, it could have come shortly after 1844, and it could have come shortly after 1888. And I believe we might be, some, our great, great grandchildren might be saying, did you know Jesus could have come shortly after 2015, but they messed it up. They didn't go on the Great Commission. Third time, let's, let's, let's not drop the ball, everybody. I hope that doesn't happen. And think about it. You know, all these great preachers that we have in the church, you know, really good guys that are out there doing, winning tons of souls. You know, someone had to study the Bible with Pastor Doug. Did you know that? How do you know that you're not going to study the Bible with the next Apostle Paul? How do you know that? You could. You know, the, we know them. We don't know the people who reached them, though. Someone reached them. An average church member reached these people. People who are doing tremendous things for the church. How do you know you won't reach that individual? We don't know who they are. We would never recognize them by looking at them now. Reason number six, I like this reason. Because God says so. Is that a good reason? We should do it. Why? Because God says so. God says we should do it. Acts 1 verse 8, notice what he says. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts, uttermost parts of the earth. You know, I don't know, has any of you ever been part of the military? Any military folk in here? When your commanding officer said, I need you to go do this, did you say, why? <laughs> can, can you give me good reasons? Convince me why I need to go do what you told me to do. Excuse me? Soldier, go. You know what? Jesus speaks, stars move. Whole solar systems move. 
trees grow, moons move. Human beings, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. You know, there's only two forces in this world that don't move when God says so. That's the devils and human beings. Everything else in the universe, as soon as God speaks, boom, you got it. Yes, sir. How high? I'm going to do it. If there's any other reason why we should go, because God says so, friends. Does he have the right to be God? Can God be God, friends? Can he speak and we do something? Should he have the right to do that? Parents, do you appreciate it when you tell your kids, Johnny, can you, can you please go sweep the room? No, don't feel like it. You love hearing that stuff? So why would our Heavenly Father like that? Don't feel like it, Heavenly Father. Nope, don't want to. Friends, we're, he's merciful. He should have snuffed us out a long time ago. God is so gracious. He's so kind. He's so loving. He's so wonderful. But hey, let's not play that game anymore, amen? Let's start obeying God. Let's move forward. And our last point, point number seven, it's God's way of saving you. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. This is an interesting Bible verse. Notice this. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you that if any would not work, he, neither should he do what? He shouldn't eat either. You know, this was a literal situation Paul was addressing, and I think it's a very good principle. But, you know, I think this also has a spiritual application. You know, I've noticed the people who eat the most, the people who are having the dynamic, powerful Bible studies, the Lord really spoke to me, are the people who are witnessing. You know, when you are dispensing, God is going to be busy giving. Sometimes you wonder, how come I don't see those things in the scripture like, you know, deacon so-and-so? How come I don't have those awesome devotions like I hear sister so-and-so have? Well, chances are it may be because you're, God is not filling your plate because you're not giving it to other people. God isn't filling your vessel because you're not pouring it out to others. I find, and I found this out personally, when I'm sharing, I am eating. God has given me a feast. And I, things just, whoa, whoa, things are just popping out. I can't, I've never seen that before. I, I'm making connections. It's because I'm sharing. And God says, you shared, now you're going to eat, son. I'm going to feed you. And we, I read a quote uh, yesterday, I believe, in Desire of Ages, where she said, it is impossible for us to develop a character like Jesus if we are not participating in his work. It is not going to happen. You will never be like Jesus if we are not participating in his work. So in summary, number one, it's God's way of saving lost people. Number two, it's God's way of building up the church. Number three, it's God's way of sanctifying his people. Number four, it's God's way of bringing unity into the church. Five, it brings the second coming of Jesus. Six, because God says so. And seven, because it's God's way of saving you. Does that sound like a good deal to you? Yeah. Does that sound like something that could be pretty detrimental to our churches if we didn't do? Can we understand why we have so many problems? So many issues? Maybe today you're saying, Gabe, I hear what you're saying. It makes sense. It's convicting me. But you know what? I tried and I got rejected. You know, I tried reaching out and you know what? Nobody's interested. I asked people, I mean, people just don't want the gospel anymore. I tried reaching out one time, and it didn't work. You know, we spent a bunch of money. We did an evangelistic meeting, and nobody got baptized at the end. We've tried. It doesn't work. And when you think about outreach, all you can think about is all these failed attempts, all these hardships, and all these obstacles. Maybe you feel unqualified. Maybe you feel scared. Just when you think about asking someone to study the Bible, you just get gripped with fear. What do I do? What do I do about that emotional issue I have to deal with. Maybe you feel like you don't even know the, your Bible well enough yourself. Why, how can I study with someone else? I barely even feel like I know this book myself. Friends, what I would like you to understand this morning is that God has incredible promises for you. The demoniac that he healed, how much scripture do you think that guy knew? Very little. He, the whole town was ready to receive Jesus because of the pre-work that man did. I'd like to show you some promises. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Jesus says, go, therefore, I will be with you always, uh, even into the ends of the world. If we will go, friends, Jesus promises, I will be with you in that Bible study. You will not give that study by yourself. I will be with you. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. Do you feel narrow-minded? Do you feel like I'm not really skilled? My grace is sufficient for thee. I will make up the lack. Notice Testimonies, Volume 7, page 31. 
the church on earth united with the church in heaven can accomplish how many things? All things. We can do anything when we're united with heaven, the Bible says. Evangelism, page 65. And the Lord will give us favor before the world until our work is done. Did you know that? Until the work finishes, God is going to give this church favor before the world. Now we know, as uh, Pastor Vyth brought out yesterday evening, the world is also going to hate us. They're going to say nasty things about us, but not to the point where the doors will fully be closed. We will have favor in this world till the work finishes. We're promised that. You could take that to the bank. Evangelism, page 17. Let us now take up the work appointed us and proclaim the message that is to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. If every Seventh-day Adventist have done the work laid upon him, the number of believers would now be much larger, much larger than it is. We could have double, triple the people at this camp meeting if every single one of us had done what God had called us to do the last 15, 20 years. Much larger. We're, we're told that. Acts of the Apostles. The truth passing by those who despise and reject it will triumph. Did you know the truth is going to win? The truth is going to win in the end, period, friends. It is going to be victorious. Although at times, apparently retarded, have you noticed that? It seems like, oh, the truth is not winning. Its progress has never been checked. The truth has never been stopped. Through the dark ages, it was not, it was not fully stopped. When the message of God meets with opposition, notice what God does. He gives it additional force that it may exert greater influence. Endowed with divine energy, it will cut its way through the strongest barriers and triumph over every obstacle. Can you say amen to that quote? Praise the Lord. Friends, God, when, when we meet opposition, God has told us, this is when I'm ready to give my truth additional power to cut through and break through to those barriers. One last quote. If our people will go forth in faith, doing whatever they can to make a beginning, just starting somewhere, and laboring in Christ's lines, the way will be opened before them if they will show the energy that is necessary in order to gain success and the faith that goes forward unquestioningly in obedience to God's command, rich returns will be theirs. Does rich returns sound interesting to you? I would love to have rich returns in my ministry. Friends, activity is essential to the life of our churches. If we don't move, we die. You know, if a body stops moving, it atrophies, it dies. Same thing with our churches, friends. And I would just like to appeal to you this evening. If you're not in the habit of carrying literature with you, start carrying literature. You know, I got a wallet, a special wallet, because it has a slot just big enough to fit glow tracks. Because I'd always, the time when op the opportunity would come up for me to share, and I would go, and I wouldn't have it on me. And I'd kick myself, man, I, I don't have literature. I bought a wallet just for that. What, let's do stuff like that. Let's carry literature. Ladies, you have purses, you have no excuse. You could, I, I've seen my mom pull food and apples out of the purses. I know you can fit literature in there. So put literature in your purses. Maybe God is telling you, you know, I need to start saving money and start devoting some funds to evangelism. You know, there's a neighbor. Man, God has been hounding me to approach that neighbor for studies. You know, maybe God is making you feel like, I need to get training. I, God is calling me to get some higher, more solid training. Friends, if you're not currently doing that, I'd just like to appeal to you tonight to do that. I'd like to finish with one last story. You know, I've found that Satan has an excuse for everybody. There, everybody has some excuse why they should not do it, even evangelists and church evangelism trainers. And you know what the excuse Satan was using on me for a period of time? You're always moving. You're here for one month, then you go here for two months, then you're here for three months. You know, you, you, you can never stop and just really solidly do something with people. I'm a planner. I like to take things from point A to Z. I like to really plan things out. And, you know, when I'm thinking studies, I'm thinking, you know, 24 lessons. I'm thinking getting baptized at the end. I'm thinking discipleship, getting them integrated into the church. That's the way I think. And Satan was saying, you, you don't have enough time. I mean, come on. One month. What are you going to do in one month? But praise the Lord, my wife piped up one day, and she said, honey, you know, I just feel like we're not doing enough. I know we move around a lot, but I, 
I just feel like we're not doing enough. And that, that convicted me. I thought, man, the Holy Spirit's been telling me that too. We, we have to do something. Well, what can you do in one month? You know, you, you pick up a move. You can't really develop a relationship with people. And I, I was sharing to her the, the objections that I had and the things I was going through. And she said, but you know, what if, what if we just gave them one Bible study? And in that Bible study, we lifted up Jesus. That would be worth it, wouldn't it? I thought, you know what? Even if we could give them this one Bible study, you're right, that would be worth it. We had a guy pull into us in the RV spot next to us, and he came in with a pretty rowdy group. There was guys doing construction on telephone wires in the area that we were currently parked, and uh, he was part of this rowdy group of guys that came in. They would stay up all night drinking and laughing and uh, stuff like that, and um, God convicted me. You need to approach that guy. We need to talk to him. His name was Richard. And so I saw Richard was outside watering his plants. And remember, you need to put yourself in the position to meet these people. We said, let's go outside and wash the car. So we went outside and we started washing the car. Hey, Richard, how's it going? We're washing the car. How have you been? How's your work going? We're talking with them. And honestly, I can't even remember how exactly it opened up. But we, we got on some subject. And I said, Richard, you know, I like to give Bible studies. I've been studying prophecy for a long time. Do you think we could sit down and have Bible studies together? He looked at me and he said, yeah, let's do it. I said, awesome, when, when can we schedule that? Schedule them, don't just walk away, schedule them. Ha have a date, a time, schedule those studies. And he said, well, how about this coming up Tuesday? So sure enough, this next Tuesday came, we showed up with our Bibles, we sat down and we had a Bible study with him and we're leaving pretty soon. And so in that Bible study, I lifted up Jesus as high as I could. And I told him how Jesus was a savior, how Jesus had died for his sins, how Jesus wants to be with him, how Jesus is calling him to surrender his heart to him. And he just sat there and just looked at me as I was giving him this study. I just was taking it in. And at the end I said, Richard, would you like to start putting your faith in Jesus? He said, I think I would. I think I would like to start putting my faith in Jesus. And he said, I wanna show you something. He opened up his Bible, his old Bible, and had a picture of this little girl. He says, this, this was my daughter. She died when she was three. I keep this in my Bible. It's special. It's special. I keep it here. And you know, you're drawing me back to this book. And I think I want to start making time for this. I said, Richard, I'm looking forward to our next Bible study. We'll have as many with you as we can before we go. We had another Bible study scheduled. He canceled. Ah, oh, man. I hate that. He canceled. But then he came to our trailer later. He said, you know what? I canceled on you guys. And... I don't know, I don't know why I did it. I, I just feel so bad about that. He said, and he started tearing up. He said, I'm sorry. You guys brought to me Jesus. You guys brought me Jesus. And I'll never forget that. I'm never gonna forget you guys, ever. And I said, we love you, Richard. He said, I love you guys too. And I said, can we pray with you? We prayed together. And I don't know what happened to Richard. We never kept in touch. But Jesus touched that man's heart. I hope we'll see him in the kingdom of heaven. You know, everybody has an excuse. All of us. There's, Satan has some reason for every single one of you why you should not be sharing your faith with someone right now. Friends, let me tell you, do not pay attention to that. That is a lie of the devil. There is something you can do to share your faith with Jesus. Figure out how to overcome it. Start praying. Start planning. Do something. I'm hoping, I'm praying that at this camp meeting, a bunch of brands lit on fire are going to go back to their areas, and back to their churches. Because, friends, we're seeing the stuff that Brother Vyth has been presenting. This world is getting crazy. It's terrible. It's getting worse. We need to wake up. We need to start doing something. Make a beginning. We have so many promises. What more could God do to encourage us? He told us. How long are we just going to say, that's great, Lord, I don't feel like it right now. How long is he going to put up with that? How long will he suffer us? How long will he endure us? There are people that in your sphere of influence, that if judiciously worked for, would be converted. I pray that if it's your decision this evening to be a witness for Jesus, to do something, pitch someone Bible studies, start giving literature, start praying for someone to, uh, to praying for God to bring someone into your life to bring to Jesus. Friends, if that's your decision, to do something more, to do something different, I just want to invite you to stand right where you are. If God is convicting you, you need to do something. You need to do something more for me, for the kingdom of God, for the gospel of God. Just stand right where you are. Don't stand because everyone else is standing. I hope all of you are convicted. I trust you are. 
but don't stand just because the crowd's standing. Stand because God is calling you. Do something more. Please, make a beginning. Start somewhere. Do something. Order those study guides. Talk to your neighbor. Start carrying that literature on you. Do something more. This world is dying, and we need to do something about it. Friends, we're the answer. If we're, out, if we're not the answer, nobody is. If we're not going to do something, no one's going to do it. Are we going to look to the government to finish the work? Are the Mormons going to finish the work? The Jehovah's Witness, are they going to finish the work? I'm sure there's good people in those churches, godly people, I'm sure. But are they going to finish the work? Do they have the three angels' message? No. Who has it? We do. And that message is to usher and to close the work on this world. We have it. We have the secret weapon. We have the element that is going to close up everything. We can do it. No one else. How can we just sit with that, friends? Make that decision and trust God to keep that commitment. Let's bow our heads. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, you see the commitments that have been made here. And Lord, you tell us that you are able, more than able, to keep that commitment and to give us the power to follow through with it. Please, Lord, consecrate in the heart of every person standing here and speak to those who maybe feel like they don't know what to do. Please guide us, lead us, but Lord, light us on fire. Help us to know we must do something or we are going to die in this world and pass the torch to another generation. I ask and pray that you would grip our hearts, that you speak to our minds, that you help us to say, Lord, what would thou have us to do? And that you help us all to do more, to be active missionaries for Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name, let all God's children say, Amen. God bless you, friends.